Good evening. Good evening and welcome very, very much to this segment of Conversations, where I'm very pleased to welcome to the program Mr. Henry Sweetbaum. Mr. Sweetbaum is an investment banker. He's an American, but he's been living in Britain for many, many years now, so he has a unique experience on the a unique experience as far as business practice is concerned. And he also has a job, if I understand, and I want you to spell this out for us if you would, Henry, but the job of helping companies that are in difficulty, in takeover situations. So in a very real sense, he represents a, uh, an element of business practice that represents true expertise, where the, where the expertise is very needed. And Mr. Sweetbaum, welcome very, very much to the conversation. Thank you, Harold. It's nice to be here with you this evening. I had a thumbnail sketch, tried to touch on some of your business activity. Maybe you could share with myself and the cable audience your own business development, how are you, what you, where your position is, what you've been doing, and then from that perspective, perhaps we could talk a little bit more about business practice and business development in the milieu between America and, and, and England. But your own business background, you're an investment banker and you've been involved in, a, in that highly experted or, or small uh, experted area of business practice of helping companies in trouble, is that more or less right? Yes, in mm -hmm. 1960, 1970, I moved to London, mm -hmm. uh, began to act as an investment banker in England and the clientele that developed for me was naturally the clientele that needed a higher level of personal expertise and involvement than they could get from the major merchant banks. Yeah. So the evolution of my work uh, initia initially began in uh, the troubled company and then evolved into larger and larger situations, mm -hmm. uh, both where companies needed rescuing and also where just some rehabilitation was required uh, for a business that was uh, perhaps had seen better days. Yes, uh-huh, uh-huh. And that does call for a um, uh, business and management skills that might be on the can of some people that are more well-established in uh, moving businesses and so forth, filling in within a large bureaucratic system or something. It's an outside consultancy and a capability to, to see and help companies from the outside in a way that rather unique and highly specialized and, and very, very well, important in those delicate situations. Huh? It doesn't really happen from the outside. Mm -hmm. What happens basically is that you first become involved in the company, perhaps as an outsider. Mm -hmm. I spent six years as chairman of the board of a British government-owned company in the computer business yeah, good. that was being rehabilitated. Mm -hmm. And the first three years, uh, I was non-executive chairman and spent most of my time outside of the company. Mm -hmm. For the last three years, uh, I became executively involved because the company needed more time, more help than you could really give it as an uninvolved or a partially involved chairman. I see. Uh huh. Uh huh. So that 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 is a distinction. But the the point is, it's a specialized skill in a certain sense. And you've been involved in a very large-scale project, if I may, uh, with, with the Wix company, which is maybe you could share that with well, us, if you would? Or? In uh, March of 1982, shortly after I left the government company, uh, Sandy Sigloff, who's chairman of the board of Wix, mm -hmm. uh, called me in London and asked if I would work with him mm -hmm. on the rescue of the Wix companies, mm -hmm. which became the largest corporate reorganization uh, non-railroad reorganization in the history of the United States. Uh, when Wix went into Chapter 11 in April of 1982, mm -hmm. uh, the company owed the banks a billion one hundred million dollars mm -hmm. and trade creditors approximately five hundred million more. Mm -hmm. So, uh, as you can see, there was a lot at stake. And at that point they called you in or called Mr. Sigaloff and you in? And well, Mr. Sigaloff mm -hmm. went in as chairman and chief executive in the United States. Uh -huh. And uh, he and I had worked together on the reorganization of Dalen mm -hmm. uh, Company in 1972. I see. And uh, because we had worked together uh, successfully, mm -hmm. uh, I was asked to help on the Wix case. And since 1982, I've been chairman and chief executive of Wix International Corporation, which is the international holding company of the Wix Group. With numbers in that proportion, that was a tremendous challenge, I should think, as you confronted it initially. I mean, it's uh, it was yeah, a tremendous yeah. challenge, yeah. and uh, uh, our wives have called mm. themselves the Wix widows yeah. ever since. So uh, the challenge is really uh, not only to me, but 
really when you do one of these to the whole family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's a, it's a, an all-out commitment. It, 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 things have to be done in not in, in unusual ways, if that's the right term, but with a, well, a great deal of dedication, a great deal of time, and it's a, it, it, it's a, it's a difficult task. The difference between managing a uh, ongoing an ongoing company mm -hmm. and a Wix type rehabilitation is that when you get involved in a Wix, there's a phase uh, that really is regrouping. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. company is virtually in free fall. Mm -hmm. uh, the losses are accelerating and in the case of Wix were very high, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, you have to stop that negative slide. Yeah. Uh, and you have to stop it very quickly. Yeah. I mean, to give you some idea, in the Wix case, mm -hmm. uh, estimates were made that had the Chapter 11 been delayed one week, the equity holders in Wix would have been totally wiped out. My Lord, it was working that close to the edge. That's and, uh, and practically uh -huh. each week another class of creditors might have been wiped out had the Chapter 11 been delayed and the rehabilitation been delayed. So you had to work with great dispatch and with great... Uh, and, and, and you did, and you've done that successfully. And that's been a successful well, turnaround. Well, on in mm -hmm. September 21st this year, uh -huh. uh, the court approved the plan of reorganization oh, okay. that uh, allows Wix to emerge from Chapter 11. And on January 26th, we'll be making the final payout of shares and warrants to the creditors uh, which will formally terminate the Chapter 11. Well, congratulations. That's, such a, that, that's a very, very rapid period of time in order to work out such a, an elaborate set of details and so forth. It's, it, it's, it would seem to me, I'm not an expert in this, but it, it was a very quickly done. It took a very short period of time to work that out. Yes, we mm -hmm. took a view with Wix uh, that there were some immense problems on the operating side to staying in Chapter 11. Uh -huh. Because when you're in Chapter 11, you have the inherent problems of suppliers, mm -hmm. employees, uh, bankers, people around the company who treat the company differently than a normal operating business. Uh -huh. And therefore, we took a decision in fairly early on, uh, I suppose about the middle of 1982, that we were going to do a fast track reorganization. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, to give you some idea, Penn Central, uh, which of course was a very large Chapter 11, yeah. the largest uh, railroad mm -hmm. Chapter 11, mm -hmm. uh, took almost eight years to emerge. Wow. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. we will see Wix emerge in less than three. Yeah, well, congratulations in terms of that. I mean, that's very, very well, that's, you know, that's very, very well done. And it's now moving, uh, it's moving well. And you have um, this kind of a, uh, of a, of a view toward these developments in, in with Wix and with other entities, we work with other entities. Are you more or less working with Wix now, or do you work with other companies, or do you continue to work well, on that? Although the Wix has taken a good part of yeah. your time. I, I don't think in in the face of a Chapter 11 of this size, mm -hmm. uh, and in the face of a a problem the size Wix was, mm -hmm. uh, you could really work on anything else. Really, so it, so oh, it's, it's a virtually yeah, full-time yeah. experience. Well, I say congratulations to you on having gotten to the point where you are in terms of uh, the successful completion of that. It must be very satisfying to take on such a challenge and then be able to see it through successfully, and uh, I, I would think. You know? September 21st was a great day. <laughs> <laughs> that was the day that it was approved. Eh? Yeah, yeah, that, that was, was the day the court, court approved it. Yeah, well, congratulations on that. You know? you've, you've been living now as, a, as an investment banker and as an American businessman in in London for what, 15 years, 12 Just years? Just about, yeah. Yeah, 15 years now. And uh, the Anglo-American uh, tie and relationship, of course, is, uh, is well-rooted. It's probably between any two nations in the world and so forth. Is it a different uh, milieu? Is it a different proposition in terms of doing business in London as it is in the United States? What are some of the differences that maybe, what are some of the differences in terms, you know, of macro views of the economy and so forth that you know or, 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 or are aware of living in Britain, doing business in Britain, but with your American background? Well, one of the most significant differences mm -hmm. in my area of work uh, is the legal structure around the rehabilitation of companies. Mm -hmm. uh, in the United Kingdom, there is no such thing as a Chapter 11. All right. uh, a company tends to go uh, from uh, its difficulties right into receivership or ultimately liquidation, mm. and very rarely uh, is there a rehabilitative phase 
that allows a troubled company to reorganize and emerge as a healthy company, hmm. mm -hmm. the way Wix did. I think that mm -hmm. I've said it often in the UK, mm -hmm. um, if Wix was a British company, Wix by now would be liquidated. Mm. Uh, there would never have been a, a rehabilitation at all. How can we account for the difference be in attitude between in between the two? Do you think? I mean. Well, there's a there's a significant difference in the law. Mm -hmm. uh, the UK insolvency law, which incidentally is in the process now of being changed, mm -hmm. but still not incorporated incorporating what I would regard mm -hmm. as an effective uh, reorganization vehicle. Mm -hmm. uh, in the new law, there is. Uh, an administrative procedure which is a stab at a chapter 11 mm -hmm. but unfortunately I don't think uh, from my experience mm. uh, that it's likely to be terribly effective mm -hmm. um, I've uh, had some discussions with some of the members of Parliament who've been involved in um, the legal process mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I suppose there's it's too much of a structural change for the British to take in one bite. Yeah, right. Uh -huh. uh, what we have uh, in the UK is a traditional, um, I suppose, in a sense, almost similar law to what America had prior to, to the introduction of Chapter 11. Mm -hmm. Please, tell me, sh could you share with us? I mean, sure. uh, I'm not that. It, it's it's a law that says that the that that uh, I think unbalances the debtor creditor relationship. Mm -hmm. Uh, it allows the banks who really take the ultimate role uh, in, an, in a um, troubled company situation to have a uh, floating charge mm -hmm. on all of the assets of the company. Uh, the effect of that situation tends to be that the banks try to work with the troubled company but on their own terms. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, this enables them to recover some of the money they've lent the company mm -hmm. uh, while it's still in trouble, mm -hmm. where the company has any positive cash flow at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, uh, when there's no hope left, mm -hmm. the bank uses its floating charge to bring in a receiver mm -hmm, mm -hmm. who mm -hmm. acts generally as an undertaker yeah, right. and either breaks up the parts uh, through sale, mm -hmm. or if it doesn't prove possible, brings in a liquidator who ultimately just liquidates the business mm -hmm. and the assets. Mm -hmm. uh, therefore, there's no um, pressure, uh, there's no um, driving force behind recovery mm -hmm. or rehabilitation. Or to, to in particularly encourage uh, in the same That's kind right. of way. Yeah, right. And of course, the sad thing is. Yeah that in an economy with high unemployment, yeah. remember Britain has, uh, what is it now, about 12% uh, unemployment, mm -hmm. uh, three, over 3 million unemployed, mm -hmm. uh, where you would hope to see rehabilitation of troubled companies. Surely. There's really no effective provision to accomplish that. Mm -hmm. If you looked at a map of the United Kingdom mm -hmm. after the last election, uh, and you separated the map into two colors, blue and red, mm -hmm. representing the conservative election uh, and the uh, successful labor candidates. Mm -hmm. What you would have uh, is a line across north and south uh, of the United Kingdom with the north of England and Scotland virtually red mm -hmm. as a block, mm -hmm. uh, Wales primarily red, mm -hmm. and the south of England up through part of the Midlands mm -hmm. are solidly blue. Uh, okay. And mm -hmm. that difference reflects what you call the sunrise and sunset industries mm -hmm. um, in the north, Scotland and Wales, where you have the traditional steel, coal, um, shipbuilding, mm -hmm. Um, heavy steel fabrication mm -hmm, mm -hmm. centered. Uh, you've got very high unemployment. There are areas of Wales and areas of Scotland with over 25% unemployment. Good heavens. And in yeah. those areas, if you didn't have the welfare state, mm -hmm. um, you probably would be in a situation yeah. of civil unrest. Yes, right, right. Mm -hmm. uh, 
the welfare state is, has kept, um, has played a positive and a negative role mm -hmm. because in one sense, it's kept the people where they are. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, of course, you have a much stronger sense of tradition in the U UK. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, people don't relocate. Uh -huh. They live where their grandfathers, great-grandfathers, great-great-great-great-great-grandfathers live. They tend to do that more so than, of yeah. course, here. They, right? they don't easily yeah, right, move. Right. Uh -huh. uh, and you also have another situation. Because of the welfare state providing low-cost housing mm -hmm. tied to a locality, Right. You get many people who would like to relocate for a job, but can't. They're because they're, it's too good a deal where they are? Well, or they, can't they, get long, yeah. they can't get another one. I see. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. If I live in South Wales, mm -hmm. uh, around Port Talbot, mm -hmm. where the British Steel Company uh, used to have an enormous works, mm -hmm. still has a very large one, but has laid off lots of people, uh, and where the coal mining industry has reduced employment very considerably. And because of that, you have very high unemployment. Mm -hmm. uh, you would think a Welshman from Clenethley mm -hmm. would pick up and move to a job in southwest London mm -hmm. where there's 3% unemployment. Yeah, it's sort of an analogy between the Sun Belt here in the United States and That's the right. Northeast and so forth. Yeah. But they don't move. They do not. The They're difference looking. is... Yeah. The Welshman stays in Wales and stays on unemployment. He's had now, some generations in time going back and would stay there. And he's yeah, uh -huh. partially it's tradition. Yeah, right. Uh -huh. uh, and that's very hard to break. Surely, yeah. Uh, when a person can go outside to the local churchyard mm -hmm. and see where 20 of his ancestors yes. were buried, right. Right. you know, he just doesn't pick up right. and move yeah. so easily. Right, it's quite true, yeah. The other problem, of course, is that he's probably living in a council house which is being supplied by the local authority mm -hmm. uh, for, say, mm -hmm. eight pounds or ten pounds a week. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, if he moves to southwest of London and he can't get on the list for a council house for a number of years, mm -hmm. then he suddenly is faced with paying a market rent, oh, right. which in that part of England is very, very expensive. Right. And clearly he couldn't get a job that would allow him uh, to pay the rent mm -hmm. so that he's locked in by the welfare state mm -hmm. to unemployment. Well, then that would relate, then that would relate the welfare state and the, 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 the welfare state that had gone a long way under labor governments and so forth, Britain, is one of the differences between, uh, well, there's a, there's a, between the United States and the British experience, but they've gone a long way down that, down that course, as oh, it were, it's very and that's, that, that marks the economy in a very, very real sense. And we could talk a little bit more about that because that's a distinguishing characteristic of the British experience and you're in a very good position to understand that but before about the the fact that the differences between the Anglo and the American experience one is they had gone a considerable line down toward uh, government intervention in the marketplace and government intervention in the overall economy in the name of the welfare state that's an uh, that that's a that's a that's a that's a, that's a characteristic would it be fair to say that they've developed the welfare state to a far greater degree than we have with our transfer payments and our Social Security, our unemployment, our methods, our Chapter 11 uh, views of of, uh, of the uh, of the of the economy, or is there is there a greater degree of governmental intervention in the economic process there? And how well, does it affect the businessman or let's say the general society? Most certainly, there's mm. a history of it. Mm -hmm. uh, if anything, the last six and a half years mm -hmm. uh, since Mrs. Thatcher became Prime Minister, uh, there's been an unraveling yeah. of the welfare state. Mm -hmm. Uh, not so much the welfare element, but certainly the uh, mixed economy uh -huh. where the government has been heavily involved in uh, private enterprise and heavily involved in business. Uh -huh. um, nationalization was the uh, certainly the byword in 1976 uh, and um, in 70, let's see, 75, 76, uh -huh. the government set up a national enterprise board uh -huh. Uh, really, I think, very much with a view towards backdoor nationalization. Yeah. Now it's moving toward privatization. And, of course, course, the Prime Minister is, yeah. uh, since she became, uh, since she m uh, went into office, mm -hmm. uh, has been doing everything she could mm -hmm. to sell off and uh, uh, return to the private sector uh, mm -hmm. as much of British industry as she can. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, as you know, the uh, one of the largest underwritings in history 
just took place where British telecoms mm -hmm. uh, raised three and a half billion dollars, mm -hmm. sorry, pounds, mm -hmm. um, and it was a very successful sale to the public. Mm -hmm. And I think she will use that uh, as a justification to continue to drive companies like British Aircraft, uh, sorry, mm -hmm. British Airways, mm -hmm. Uh, back into the private sector, or at least 50% into the private sector. It sounds somewhat similar to our situation with Mr. Reagan in the political sense. Now, Mr. Reagan favors the private enterprise situation and is not so well disposed toward, you know, traditional government intervention. So we're, we have an analogy between the two. I, mean, I think they would both describe themselves as rather conservative. Yes, yeah, right. We have that. It's a, a thing. Uh, but in the Britain, I mean, they have the, uh, the, the, the rebirth or the recapturing of the entrepreneurial spirit, the developing of new... Um, New industries and, and uh, that sort of uh, that thrust or that kind of thinking is it is it alive and kicking and well in Britain? The entrepreneurial I spirit or what's the fate of the or the prognostication for the entrepreneurial development of new sunrise I th industries? I think in Harold, um, it's happened. Um, Britain has always had some element uh, of entrepreneurial spirit. Mm. Uh, it's been diverted in the last probably 15, 20 years heavily into the property sector mm -hmm. uh, because that's where the clearing banks, the large banks, were willing to provide the venture finance mm -hmm. where they could see the, uh, bricks and mortar yeah. uh, as a means of securing their loans. Uh, the last 10 years has probably seen some shift of venture capital money into uh, technology, into the sorts of venture capital uh, opportunities, um, genetic engineering, yes, biotechnology, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, into uh, those sorts of areas uh, in Britain, just as we've seen it in the States. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a corridor from London west, uh, virtually to the Welsh border and mm -hmm. perhaps into Wales, uh, that's really the equivalent of the Silicon Valley mm -hmm. experience in the States. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, probably not to the degree in terms of size and scope, mm -hmm. uh, but certainly uh, on a smaller scale, mm -hmm. the same sort of mentality. Yeah, well, Roy Bright and the people at uh, Prestel and developing a centralized database, the British Open University, for that matter, in a television mode, are, re are representations of uh, leading edge uh, information developments that are being encouraged and so forth in Britain. A great deal of innovation comes from Britain, has come traditionally from Britain. And oh. while some people tend to think uh, Britain is, uh, you know, a little bit behind, uh, they're, they're, it's an innovative and a surprising country. They keep coming up with surprises and new, new developments that uh, uh, show that it's alive and well and doing, doing well indeed and will be. Well, my experience, both in telecommunications and the computer industries mm -hmm. in Britain, uh, have been that uh, British basic technology is second to none. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, they're certainly... It's a country that's always at the leading edge. Mm -hmm. There's a tremendous quality of academia, mm -hmm. uh, both technically mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, the classical scholar. Yes, of course. Yeah. But uh, I don't think there's any doubt that Britain will continue to play a major role uh, and a leading role technologically. Mm -hmm. Techn uh, the question of, of their future Mm -hmm. uh, is whether they can successfully translate that technology mm -hmm. into a product at a price mm -hmm. that will appeal to a market and allow Britain to become uh, dominant mm -hmm. in sectors of the marketplace in techno technological areas. Uh, you know, Britain must live as, as an exporter. Yes, right. Uh, as Japan. <laughs> yeah, that's Two right. Two islands off the continent of... That's right. I mean, they, 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 there are a lot of similarities between Britain and Japan. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, Britain has not really been the, uh, the winner in any comparison between the two over mm -hmm. the last uh, 25 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think Britain has to learn the skills of marketing, mm -hmm. uh, the risk taking, uh, a dedication to market dominance mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. that the J Japanese have have certainly used to prosper. Mm -hmm. Well, Britain did well in terms of building up the basis of the industrial process on a worldwide basis and has had a tremendous uh, 
grounding in terms of that. I mean, so much of it has come out of Britain, and the technology is very, but it could it could be well served by good management capability in order to help translate the technological understanding and the, the, the inventiveness of the British mind into good business practice around the world. And it would seem to me, if I may say so, that Britain has done well to have uh, Henry Sweetbaum come to the shores to help out, to get a, a feeling for what's going on and to give good business advice and development in terms of the British experience. I suppose you're enjoying yourself there and you look forward to uh, operating out of, uh, out of London in terms of uh, the business purview. It's an exciting and interesting and rewarding place to, to view the world. Well, Britain has been a good host, mm -hmm. and I hope I've been a good guest. Mm -hmm. But uh, yes, I, I love living there. I've been very happy there. Uh, I find it an exciting and a rewarding uh, place to both live and work, uh -huh. and uh, I'd like to continue to do so. Okay. Okay. Well, it's good. It's it's a, it's an interesting experience, and it's one we've only just been able to touch on the surface of. But the the connection between our country and uh, and Britain, of course, is so long-standing that it's uh, it's it's basic. And it seems to me you have a very unique and interesting perspective, having lived so long there and at the heart of the business community there, and understanding these problems. I appreciate going talking for hours about some of the implications of the of the of the of the difference between the two societies. But I'm sorry, we're out of time. May we just thank you very much. Thank you, and perhaps we'll do it again someday. I would hope so. That would be good. It would be good. It's been your pleasure. I'd remind you in the cable television audience to have the perceptions of Henry Sweetbaum then investment banker again who has been living in London now for these past 15 years working in the very delicate and difficult and challenging area of helping troubled companies uh, achieve turnover situations. I congratulate you on the success of the Wix operation that was done in, in record speed, record time with efficiency and um, has helped to give us some understanding of the difference between Britain and American experience and the similarities because understanding that tie is uh, crucial to all of us here in terms of the decision-making process of general society. American Anglo ties and, and essentially uh, is an, incre an incredibly essential one. Happy to have you view that and stay tuned, please. There'll be more coming up in the same general topic area of uh, business opportunity, marketing, and so forth uh, momentarily. But that's it for this particular segment. We're coming right back. Henry, once again, thank you very much indeed for everything. Thank you, Howard. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome very, very much to this segment of Conversations, where I'm very pleased to welcome to the program Mr. Victor Kayam. Mr. Vic Kayyem is uh, an institution here in the United States, being Chief Executive Officer of uh, Remington Products Incorporated and having launched what is seen by many as one of the most successful advertising campaigns in the economy. Victor, welcome very, very much to the conversation. Thank you, Harold. I wonder if you might share for us your, 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 your involvement in the Remington Company because it's become almost an institution now, that advertisement that you put forth about how you bought the company because you like the product so much. Maybe you share a little bit how you actually did come to be in the position of... Uh, you know, taking over the Remington Company, because in and of itself, it's an exciting business story. Well, I was very fortunate uh, in many ways. Uh, the company had fallen on hard times. Mm -hmm. It was owned by a company called Sperry Rand at the time, mm -hmm. and it didn't fit their area of, of expertise. They're mm -hmm. a high-tech company, yeah, yeah. and this was a marketing company. And in the last four years that they had it, they lost $30 million. Uh. Their market share had gone down to, in the United States, it was 19% uh -huh. of the shavers that were sold. Uh -huh. And I was very lucky. I was able to uh, do a leveraged buyout, yeah. which I think you're quite familiar with. Uh -huh. uh, but in my particular case, it was very exciting because I only had to put up 2% of the uh, monies required in equity. All right. And I was able to, to achieve 100%. Uh, of the equity of the company. Mm -hmm. And uh, the then problem was that we didn't have any cash to fall back upon, so cash became king. And yes. it wasn't profits necessarily. We mm -hmm. had to conserve our money. Yeah. And we did successfully. And the company in the last, uh, it's been five years now, in my first year there, we had sales of $47 million. Mm -hmm. And this year, which will end about February, uh, we should have sales of around 160 million. Well, congratulations! That's well, a real growth you. over a short period of time. And you'd been involved in marketing all throughout your career. You'd been with well, other companies. Well, I Benrons think and other no, I'd been uh, with Lieber Brothers and Playtex, uh, but I essentially uh, am what is called a peddler. Ah. Uh, I believe if I believe in a product, mm -hmm. I will work my tail off to make it successful. Uh -huh. And initially, I started out as a salesman, uh, calling on drugstores and supermarkets and the normal channels of trade mm -hmm. and then as uh, things progressed and I went up the, the ladder 
Uh, I went into something called marketing, which mm -hmm. is really mm -hmm. nothing more than taking the pieces and putting them together mm -hmm. uh, so that the entire uh, complexity of bringing a product from the production stage to the consumer mm -hmm. uh, takes effect. So then the advertising is a large part of that, and oh, the campaign yes. that you had has been cited by many as perhaps one of the most successful campaigns in the history of American advertising. Well, you know, was it your idea? Or well, was it yeah, a, I was going to say, yeah. you'd say, mm -hmm. gee, that must have been some genius who sat in a dark room in an advertising agency. Lots of consultants. In Madison, <laughs> I might have it. I'll tell you about consultants in yes, a minute. Yes. Uh, but that's not how it happened. Mm -hmm. It happened out of a discussion in England, uh -huh. and the commercial actually ran in England because we had written a commercial and I brought it over to England for our English company to run uh -huh. and the agency over there had a commercial they, they preferred and we uh -huh. had a heated discussion uh -huh. and then we broke for tea and somebody yeah. asked me mm. the same question you just did mm. how does a bloke like you mm. that's what bloke. they bloke yes, yes. yes how does a bloke like mm. you walk off the street and buy a company like Ramigan? Uh -huh. this was unheard of yeah. in the United Kingdom they just don't uh, think that way there are differences yeah uh, mm -hmm. in the beginning if you get a little more uh, Extrovertish in mm. their in their financing, uh -huh. okay. uh, but uh, at that point in time, uh, uh, leverage buyouts were unheard of. Mm. And I explained it to them, and they were all entranced. And I said, "If you're so interested, yeah. this was the agency people." Right. I said, "Do you think that the average Briton might be interested I in the story?" And they said, mm. "Oh yes." Yeah. And I said, "Well, why don't we write that commercial and tell it?" Mm -hmm. And they said, "Okay, we'll get a big football star to do it." Uh -huh. And I said, what the devil do you want a big football When you story? got me. Huh? Well, how <laughs> could he tell the story that I liked the product yeah, so right, much, right. I bought the company, right, right. which is really what happened. And I fell in love with the product. And that's really true. That's, that's really, really true. true. And, uh, uh, okay. uh, I, well, what happened, uh, it's, uh, that's an amusing story. Uh, I had become aware that the company was for sale, the, the Remington division. Yeah. And I went over and got all the financial records, and I came home and I spread them on our dining room table. Right. And my wife came home uh, about 6 o'clock and said, clean off the table. Yeah. And I said, what do you mean, clean off the table? It take me an hour to lay it all out because each year is books and records. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, I don't want to eat in the kitchen because it's hot and it's smelly, so clean off the table. <laughs> well, I don't know how it is right. in your house. Yeah, right? I understand. But it this is, is a major, this is yeah. not a major decision. Uh -huh. This is one she makes. Uh -huh. I make the decisions whether or not we should lend money to Tanganyika right. as a nation. Yeah, yeah right. That kind of stuff right. is yeah. in my bailiwick. Right, 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 right. But this was hers, so with yeah. a sort of sheepish and mm. hang dog look, mm. I took those books and I began mm. piling them on a chair. Yeah. She says, what are you looking at anyway? Yeah. yeah. So I looked at her and I said, the Remington Consumer Products Division of Sperry. Mm. She thought for a minute, she said, they make electric shavers, yeah, don't right, they? Right. I said, yeah. Mm. She said, how could you possibly buy that company? Mm. You've never used an electric shaver in your life, which true? was true. Yeah, yeah. So I gave her my steely-eyed look and I said, honey, I was in the brassiere business for 12 years and I never wore one of them <laughs> either. <laughs> That's good. So yeah, uh, yeah. she went out yeah. the next day and bought me uh, a Remington. Uh -huh. And I flipped over really? because yeah. I had never believed an electric shaver could shave clothes. Yeah. I knew they were comfortable. Uh -huh. I knew they were convenient. I knew they were easy to handle. Uh -huh. No mess. Uh -huh. But I didn't think they shaved. Uh -huh. And I just fell in love with that darn product. And you really did. I uh -huh. really did. And then I, that was probably very bad because yeah. then uh -huh. I might have been able to make a better deal. But I was so anxious to get the company. Uh -huh. And I was so lucky. They just brought that product out. Uh -huh. And the prior management had said, this is a great product. Uh -huh. But the corporate boy said, look. For 10 years, we've been suffering with, right. with this division. Uh -huh. We want to get rid of it. Uh -huh. So we're going to sell it anyway. Yeah, right. So I got that terrific product, mm -hmm. and I got uh, uh, the Remington brand name and worldwide distribution. And then the advertising started in England after that discussion, yeah. and we went at the agency, went in the back room, wrote uh -huh. a commercial, and right. that commercial, 85 to 90 percent of it is what you see on the air today. That's right. And it runs in in 31 countries mm -hmm. now in 15 languages really worked really worked it huh? really has and you had the creative input on that really it was your idea and well it was it was a uh, idea uh, that was uh. sparked in england yeah. and uh, what's happened which is amazing is that our sales our first year sales worldwide in units were a million two hundred and some odd thousand shavers uh -huh. and this year we will sell about four and a half million shavers so it's almost a fourfold increase in five years. Is that ad work in other markets and so forth? Oh, you yes. Place the same one. Yeah. Same one. In yeah. other languages? Well, yeah. I do them all. You do it in, a, it comes out your voices in another language or something? What do you mean my voices? Yeah. I do them. Oh, right. I okay. sit in front of a yeah, camera right. and I right. say, Yes. Bonjour. <laughs> J'étais toujours de voter de rasoir à l'âme jusqu'à ma femme m'a acheté le rasoir électrique. 
Remington. Very good. Konnichiwa. <laughs> Watashiga. Remington Microsheen Chevada. Tayan Kiri. Kaishiwo. Kaitori Mashita. You enough? Can't, you can't. Yeah, enough, enough. You don't enough, want enough. the Gutentag? No, 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 that's great. That's okay. good. That's really good. You learned well, all that. Well, I, I'm a linguist of 29 seconds. Uh -huh. yeah. All right, you got go, to go to 29 seconds. Right? Well, that's what yeah. the commercial is. You uh -huh. go to 31 seconds, right. I'm shot. Uh, I see, right. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. It is interesting. You said that you, you, you know, you're as a marketing person, that you had a faith in the product. That's important to have that. I mean, could the... Could you get as enthused about something if it was a little bit not? You know what I'm saying? You really have faith. You really believe in the product. I couldn't. That's important I for couldn't be in. I couldn't. You couldn't sell something you didn't have a real sense real of, faith, uh, faith and, in. And also, it has to be a quality product. Yeah, if right. you came to me with a product, a mm -hmm. necktie, yeah. and you said I can make neckties for ten cents less mm -hmm. than anybody else can make it in the world, and better or not well, as good? Ah, uh -huh. that would be the question. Yeah, right. Is it better? Right, right. Uh, right. Otherwise, yeah. I wouldn't be interested. You wouldn't be interested no. unless it was something you could really believe in. Unless it was better, good quality. Right. Right, it right. has to have a USP. Do you remember Ross Arise? Yeah, I do. Vaguely, Ross Arise yeah. was a fellow who was the head of Bates Advertising. Uh -huh. And he came up, Ted Bates and company, mm -hmm, yeah. came up with a, a phrase which I have followed, which I believe is very uh, pertinent to selling any product. Mm -hmm. That's to have something in your product that no other product has. We uh -huh. call it a, he called it a USP. What's that? Unique selling proposition. Okay, right, right. Now, right. in ours, we say it shaves as close as a blade mm -hmm. or your money back. Mm -hmm. That's our unique selling proposition. Yeah, right, right. Either we perform, mm -hmm. or we give you your money back. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then we tell why, because it has two foils mm -hmm. and powerful motor and all the reasons why uh -huh. it does shave as close as a blade. You now have responsibility for maintaining quality control and that kind of thing and see any kind of improvements on quality and so forth that you would as chief executive. Oh, so well, you, you might not have had if you were in well, a marketing it, it, position it, it, for a product it, developed by someone else. Yes, no, 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 not no. that way. Okay. In a marketing in in marketing when you're responsible for bringing a product from the production stage to the consumer. Mm -hmm. Uh, you better darn well have control of the ultimate quality when it reaches you. Uh -huh. You don't accept anything that's not a, uh, that's not full quality standard, uh -huh. because you're responsible as a marketeer for placing it in the hands of the consumer. If it doesn't work, uh -huh. it's going to come back. And it's not just all a matter of what the bottom line shows in the end. It's a matter of a sense of what integrity. Is that the right term? In I terms think of that's that, what it is. It really is. So it comes down to. I think if you, you've got to be honest with your public, we we look at Remington. Uh, it's a private company. Yeah. Well, we've tried to, to create a company that's almost uh, a family company. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that's unique about us is we're the by far the smallest electric shaver company in the world uh, as a corporation. Yeah, we, major, I, yeah. Well, we sell one of every four electric shavers sold in the world. Wow. It's a mm -hmm. lot. It is. And we have a volume of about $160 million. But some of our competitors uh, are just enormous. Our biggest competitor is Matsushita that mm -hmm. does about $50 billion. Yes, That's yeah. in a whole range of products. That's rather large. Philips, yeah. which yeah, owns yeah. Norelco. Yes, right. Uh, and they just bought Schick. Mm -hmm. We're suing them for antitrust. Really? Yeah, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they bought another company because they're trying to put us out of business. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, Where do you sue them? I mean, and we sue them in the federal court. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You've got to go to court to try to stop it. But it's mm -hmm. definitely an antitrust situation. Mm -hmm. Trial, the, court, the case has been going on for almost three years now. Really? Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, but Philips is $22 billion. Yeah. You know, they make light bulbs, yeah. they make microwaves, oh, they make gigantic, a lot of stuff. Gigantic, yeah. Well, we're competing with all these people, uh -huh. and we're the only U.S. shaver company. There is uh -huh. no other. Uh -huh. We're it. Uh -huh. And we're competing on a worldwide basis against, in, in the environment the of a strong dollar, yeah. too. Uh -huh. Yeah, right. So it, it's a tough road, but we're winning. Yeah, do you think that's a good thing in a certain sense? You might have certain kinds of, like, almost entrepreneurial, or uh, you, you can move quickly and creatively and so forth, whereas sometimes corporations that are so large and ponderous and bureaucratic might have a little bit difficult time moving with the alacrity and being able to pick up on a new marketing idea and so forth as a maybe a little smaller company, one that's a little bit closer. I agree with that. You know, I, understand? I yeah. think that's I think an the asset. spirit of entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneur, entrepreneur tends to get lost within large corporations, don't they often? You know? Well, today the large corporations are looking to more of a spirit for, of entrepreneurship. You know, the PC Junior uh, of IBM and mm. their whole uh, personal computers yeah. were transferred out of corporate headquarters down here to Florida. That, they, that's right. Yeah, and yeah, they, yeah, they, and they set up a small group of 30 or 40 or 50 people, I don't know how many, to yeah. develop this product. Because uh -huh. they wanted an entrepreneurial entity 
that would not be swallowed up in the mm -hmm. maze of corporate bureaucracy. It's a little hard to do within the corporation to do that, don't you think? Or hey, well, yeah, if the yeah. chief executive makes a commitment that that's what he wants done, uh -huh. he can do it. Uh -huh. If he uh, says, well, uh, we're going to do business as usual, uh -huh. We're going to have the same, same rules of ROI. Yeah. You know what ROI, return, Our, yeah, return, return on investment. investment. Yeah, yeah. We're going to have the same rules of minimum uh, pre-tax profits mm -hmm. production mm -hmm. uh, produced. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, then you're never going to be successful uh, creating an entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial environment. Mm -hmm. If you say, look, we're going to go in this business. I don't think we can make money the first mm -hmm. two years. Mm -hmm. We're going we're gonna to go into this business on an incremental cost basis mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so that that little business is not going to share the overhead mm -hmm. of the chief executive, of right. the computer, right. of all of that. Yeah, yeah. We're but let's get, it, real, off, right. let's yeah, get yeah. it off yeah. the ground right, right. first, mm -hmm. make it successful, mm -hmm. and then we'll worry about uh, charging it with uh, uh, a heavier burden. Yeah, well, these would, be some of the, these would be some of the burdens or challenges that would confront anyone entrepreneurially who's developing a new, uh, a new company, a new product out of whole cloth in a certain sense. They'd have to meet those tests, oh, and that sure. would have to be done within the corporate structure, larger corporate structure, a little difficult because but it's this, this, creative But this last, quality this last uh, few years, yeah. and I think in the 80s, instead of the age of conglomeration, which occurred in the 60s and the early 70s, yeah. Today, I think it's the age of entrepreneurship. Uh -huh. The major corporations are looking for the self-starters, those uh -huh. people who, who have a commitment to success, uh -huh. who are willing to uh, devote time and energy uh, and their sweat and blood mm. to achieving a success, uh -huh. rather than those people who are uh, willing to execute uh, the corporate dictum yeah. without any ingenuity or creativity. Yeah, there seems a little bit more creativity and so forth, characteristic of the situation, less security seeking behavior than there was in the past. I think so. Or maybe it has to do with macro terms. We're moving into an informational environment. We heard terms like uh, sunrise industries, the new information technologies and so forth that offer new opportunities. So it's a, it's a, it's a yeasty time because we're in a time of major transition from a, let's say, industrially based uh, sunshine or sunset industries to these new information-based technologies and so forth. So there's a great deal of uh, new product developing in computers, robotics, other kinds of fields that offers a kind of new, new milieu or a new, a new context for new opportunities that were not able to be taken in so well or developed so well by the corporate strategies that had developed in the industrial past. So we're at a time of well, closing parentheses be, or I think something, so it, it favors the entrepreneur in a certain way. Well, I think the old, I don't like to call them sunset industries because mm. I think that the basic industries of our country, if we lose them, we're going to be in deep trouble because they're the ones that really uh, provide the jobs yeah. uh, for our society. And what's happened is we've been exporting jobs like crazy yeah. overseas. Mm -hmm. So I don't describe them, I uh, call them the old smokestack industry. No, we need both. The, the I, I don't like the word sunset. It sounds like they're passing out of the picture. Yeah. Uh, How about sunrise? The new well, industry. the new, new industry. New possibilities, new technologies. Uh, I think you can have new technologies in old industries. I mm -hmm. don't think you should preclude that. Uh -huh. And robotics uh, are just as effective in the old manufacturing areas as they are in the new industrial areas. Yeah, more so in those areas. No, yeah. You're right, right, right more right. so. Mm -hmm. So what I would say is that... Uh, no matter what the field is, whether it's the new developing technology or the old uh, uh, indoctrinated industries that mm -hmm. we've had, mm -hmm. today they're looking for creativity, ingenuity, more uh, commitment. And I think the young people who are going into the workforce today mm -hmm. are completely different from what they were 20 years ago. Yeah, they're looking for some creative opportunity and challenge. That's yeah. right. And, they, and, and they're looking at, at a career mm -hmm. as an opportunity rather uh, than work is something yeah, they had to, to do, do to get done yeah right well that's uh, that's encouraging sociologically very, in a very real sense very yeah, encouraging I mean, for the health and vigor of the economy and for the society right you're generally uh, optimistic as you begin to look ahead in terms of the well I, i've never thought that uh, glass was half empty i've always thought the glass was half full yeah uh i don't think uh, that you have problems i think you have opportunities uh-huh uh, i never say uh, if we if we have something that's wrong I say, okay, we got a lemon. Yeah. How can right. we make lemonade? Right. Okay. That's an idea. You know, that's nice. That's nice. Uh, that's a nice line. It could be part of a, you know, campaign. Well, camp I don't campaign. think we'll take that yeah. as a campaign, Maybe. but it's a philosophy yeah. of life that uh, you don't give up. Mm -hmm. if, uh, I have weaknesses. I have one very bad one. What's that? I won't give up. Uh -huh. And a lot mm -hmm. of time, I spend a lot of uh, too much mm -hmm. time on something that really can't make it, uh -huh. or even after we do make it successful, it really isn't worth that much to anybody. Uh, but I just don't, I won't quit. Yeah. And we developed one product, for example, which I'm very proud of, which from a financial point of view, uh, I don't think any other company would have gone into, but we went into an electronic swimming pool alarm. 
which uh, goes off if anything over eight pounds falls in the pool. In Good the pool. for you. Good for you. And we've already had some very heartwarming letters from people yeah. where we've actually yeah. helped prevent sure. drowning. Absolutely. And yeah. uh, we're not going to make. We're not going to get rich on it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that's a social product. It I is. Think that's something that's going to be to the betterment of the people. You do. You think that you got a responsibility. Uh, there's a responsibility and a part of business leadership to be thinking in those terms about products that might not realize the best bottom line performance, but have a social. I mean, a value in terms of providing If you happen to be services. involved and can, and can find such a product, yes. I uh -huh. think also uh, a businessman and company should be involved in their communities. Uh -huh. They should be involved. We shouldn't just work for ourselves. See, if you look at Japan, uh -huh. the average Japanese person works for three people. Uh -huh. He works for himself, his company, uh -huh. and his country. Uh -huh. Uh, in the United States, up until recently, I think those things have changed. Uh -huh. The average individual, when he went to work, said, why am I working? Mm -hmm. What's in it for me? Mm -hmm. Today, there's a little more a thought process about what's in it for my company. Mm -hmm. uh, because I, if I drain it, mm -hmm. then my company may not survive. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think the third part of it is that we've got to think about uh, productivity for our nation mm -hmm. so that we can be competitive in this world. Yeah, right, against the Japanese performance or, and, uh, or others, or others right. that are emerging in that, play, in, in that sort of thing. You think it is that if we have a... Um, you're familiar with ESOP, employee stock ownership plans, sure, or very. generally expanding ownership, particularly among management and uh, employees of a corporation, a sense of ownership of that entity of which they're a part, other than just wage earners, as an incentive toward increased productivity? Well, or let, me let me tell you what I did at Remington. When I got in there, the company had lost all his money. Mm -hmm. I was afraid that a lot of people, and they were, leaving because one guy walking in when you had a $5 billion company yeah. behind it, right. and they couldn't make it. How right. could one guy make right. it? I offered them the opportunity of a six, the, the management at this point, uh, a six percent wage increase, mm -hmm. or if we, they would get no wage increase, mm -hmm. or if we were profitable, we'd pay them fifty percent of their salary as bonus. Wow! Uh -huh. And we were successful. They uh -huh. got that. Today, everybody in our company is on incentive. Okay. Uh, and the managers of our most of our companies uh, overseas, et cetera earn as much as 10% of the pre-tax profit. Okay. In other words, if they make $100, the they company, get they get 10 bucks. All right, 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 right. And right. so they share in it. And that hel that helps productivity or a sense oh, of involvement? That, in oh, it, that it makes it make them it feel... Contributes to a sense of human dignity in that which well, is... Well, I don't know. Sometimes they're lost bureaucratic. No, no, no that's... That, you know, right. I okay. hate to tell you, but that's, okay. that's all just plain verbiage. That yeah. doesn't mean anything. Yeah, okay. It gives them a sense of ownership, mm -hmm. of participation, it's mine. If yeah. I produce, mm -hmm. I get a piece of it. Right, right, right. Which if I don't produce, I don't get a piece. Yeah, and traditionally in the American economy, way back, let's say, the beginning of the Republic and that, people were doing things of their own effort. What they created was theirs. And then it became to be where the ownership of large entities working on assembly lines and so forth, they began to lose some of that sense of participation with an alienating experience. Well, you, you had this might be a way and the them. Don't forget, you had the, the so-called white collar and blue collar. Mm. What we've done at Remington is do away with any collar. We don't uh -huh. have a blue collar or a white collar. We only have one. We have no unions anywhere in the world. And all we have is the Remington collar. Huh. And everybody is in profit participation. They oh. have a profit sharing plan as well as a personal incentive plan. The well, fact that they have this employee ownership or the, you know, that, per, that incentive for the people in the company made a big difference in terms of your company and it's a good general advice that there be a sense of involvement on the part of people that ownership and a sense of direct participation in the corporate activity, in that, that, that's a means for encouraging productivity as we begin to look ahead. Well, not only we productivity, have. but mm. interest and commitment. Yeah, you know, right. if, if you have a share of it, I think most people would like to own their own thing. You, I think so, right. You've been doing yeah. this show for, what, 10, 11, 12 years? 12 years, years yeah. 12 forever, years. Forever. But you feel a part of it. It's your baby. Well, it does, yeah. It even goes on to your own free spirit in a certain sense, doesn't That's it? I mean, right. a sense of ownership has that quality to oh, it in a certain gosh, sense. Oh, gosh, yes. Yeah. And you feel that... Yeah, I'm, I'm working for the company, but I'm getting something out of it also. Mm -hmm. I'm participating. Yeah. And I think it, that's key to the psyche uh, to want to do it. You mm -hmm. know, if you're uh, mm -hmm. in New York City, if you yeah. go around and you see how many markets, Korean markets, have opened up in They're New York. Beautiful. I mean, They're beautiful. Aren't they beautiful? beautiful. Most of them, yeah. most of the Koreans live above. Uh -huh. uh, they work 24 hours a day. Yeah, They're yeah. open all night. Right. They have a commitment. Yeah. They uh -huh. came from a very poor <coughs> society relatively, mm -hmm. the standard of living, they've got an opportunity, mm -hmm. and they're willing to work their tails yeah, off. Yeah, right, right, right. That commitment is really important, you know, almost in like, what, sociological or psychological terms, you get a sense of purpose of what you're doing. If you're engaged in something that gives you a sense of, you know, real participation, purpose in life, then that really leads to a richer and fuller 
life. And it also rather than just sort of oh, I drifting definitely. along without a sense of purpose or direction. You know, well, I think too many people maybe are in or at well, least alienation. Or I don't know. I, a sense I think of malaise. We use, we have the term malaise. You know, we use the term malaise. Yeah, you lose life. the term malaise. Yeah. But I, I I think that it comes down to a sense of accomplishment. Mm -hmm. If you do a good job mm -hmm. and you're recognized, maybe not even financially sometimes. Mm -hmm. Just by the fact that somebody says, "Hey, you did a good job," yeah, right. that is worth uh, X dollars to yeah, an individual. Right. The, the recognition, the yeah. sense of accomplishment. Yeah. I look at us, and what I'm interested in is building a successful company. All right. Yeah. Uh, fortunately, today I don't have to worry where the next meal comes from. Uh -huh. But every nickel that this company makes, uh -huh. we pay no dividends. Uh -huh. We reinvest it in the business. Yeah, reinvest it in Remington. In Remington uh -huh. to keep building it and uh -huh. make it stronger uh -huh. instead of taking the money out and mm -hmm. uh, if consuming it, and, or, yeah, or right. going and sitting on a beach somewhere. Yeah, right. I, I'm, I'm too yeah. young to sit on a beach. Yeah, right. I, would, I wouldn't know what to do. Uh -huh. I could go away on vacation for, at maximum, I would say one week mm -hmm. and I'll go stir crazy. Yeah, you will. You want to be engaged in the I want to do yeah. something. What if you're sitting on the beach, you could be thinking things through maybe? Uh, well, maybe how long can you think? Maybe, I, you know, maybe I eight days, maybe eight, nine days. Uh, maybe. Listen, no, no, I, I think no. that's a wonderful panacea yeah. for you to say, well, you can sit on the beach. I can sit yeah. on an airplane flying for three and a half hours and mm. think too. Yeah, right. Well, you can uh, think anywhere. You can I mean, think anywhere. Mind is, uh, so, I mean, if you want to use that as an excuse mm. to get away and sit on the beach, go ahead and do it. I was just saying, you know, let yourself let up a little bit in that because sometimes things come through when you're in mode and it's not all in that kind of way. Now Remington, are you diversifying in Remington and are you getting involved yourself, interest, your own interest? I know you've got other companies that you're interested in, other activities outside of Remington that you're interested in, entrepreneurially or otherwise, or well, do you I've share been, your own dimension? I think I've been a little too uh, active in the last year. We acquired a necktie company that was going uh, uh, bankrupt and uh, as a matter of fact when we signed the final papers the sheriff had padlocked the door. This oh was this was in April of 83, and it employed about 325 people. We've mm -hmm. turned the company around. Sure. We're now employing over 500 people. That's in Wilmington, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. I was uh, uh, too heavily involved in other outside activities, and I say too heavily. I became chairman of the U.S. Savings Bonds Drive for Fairfield County for two years, and I didn't know it. Yeah. I thought it was for one year. So in the second year, I also assumed the uh, United Way mm -hmm. leadership. Mm -hmm. And both of those took a tremendous amount of they time, did. and they were both in the same mm, uh, same year. Yeah. Oh, really? And then I had the acquisition, mm -hmm. and uh, we also have another company which uh, does business with mainland China, uh -huh. and we import jewelry from mainland China. We actually design it for them now, uh -huh. and we're the largest user of jewelry from mm -hmm. mainland China in the world. Well, then that's it's a called the thing. Friendship Collection. If you went up Fifth Avenue, yeah. you'd find it at Altman's, Lord & Taylor, Saks Fifth Avenue, Bonwit Teller. It's oh, got yeah. not only national distribution, it's in Harrods and Selfridges in London, Old Pranto in Paris. Magnificent. The designs coming out of mainland China? Do well, no. The designs, we do the designs, the labor is done there. Uh -huh. Because they design, uh, uh, their designs are fairly stereotyped. Uh -huh. Nobody in China wears jewelry. Oh, is that right? Yeah, okay. I don't know if you knew that. No, I didn't. I'm not that familiar with it, you know. I know that it's a tremendously interesting experiment that's going on over there. There's a huge market that's going to be certainly developed. Well, you, they won't let you sell it there. Yeah. You have to buy it uh, out for the outside world. So you've taken some of this interest in companies outside of Remington and so forth, but you want to keep a tight rein on that and keep that, and that's the main activity that you're involved in now. And I heard you say earlier on in the interview that you think it's important for people in those positions to do things like United Way and other kinds of socially responsible things. I think you have to... Do you think you can get too dispersed to where you lose oh track yeah, you of that? you got to keep your... Uh, priorities. priorities. I think uh, next year if I do one of those outside activities, that'll mm -hmm. be a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, we've been very fortunate. We have a university next door to us called the University of Bridgeport. Mm -hmm. And there's a marvelous president there. And we talked and we founded which Remington actually underwrites, mm -hmm. a school of entrepreneurial studies. Really? Okay. And yeah. uh, uh, this, the company pays for one professorship, mm -hmm. and I try to pay for two others by giving speeches, for which I get paid for, oh, you're and I give all the money for the speeches to the University of Bridgeport. And they get your expertise, then? The well, as much the as they can. Then? I yeah. speak uh, periodically, but it's more of a of uh, educational process over, you know, it's a regular school, don't you, yeah. Yeah, don't, uh, but I, I haven't got time that I can give a weekly course. Yeah, I understand. Don't you think it's good that the people who are learning that learn it from people who are actually engaged in the real world oh, rather definitely. than just all theoretical? Oh, There's so definitely. much theoretical going on in terms of management practice or management schools and so forth. If they could have more, you know, relationship with people who are actually in the field doing things, uh, there should be a bridging of the gap between what is educational and what is 
real world activity. You know, to, to get a, a very high level in the educational process, most uh, institutions require a master's degree or yeah. even a PhD. MBA. Yeah. Uh, uh, or mm. a master's of whatever. Yeah. Uh, and then a PhD to get the highest level. Well, mm. anybody that goes through that process probably mm. doesn't have a business career. Mm -hmm. So everything he teaches yeah. is theoretical. It's all theoretical, yeah. Whereas you take a businessman who maybe has a BA. Yeah, right. Or, or maybe he didn't even go to college, right. but he's been successful in the business mm -hmm. world. He is probably as good a teacher mm -hmm. as one of the other people who have taken the the educational uh, uh, process to arrive at uh, the professorship level. Yeah, I would have thought so. I mean, so it should, should be a mix. It should and, be a mix. Yeah. And, and they don't. Th there isn't enough of that. There isn't enough. A right. lot of the graduate, a lot of the people uh, like Harold Williams, yeah. uh, who became uh, dean of the Stanford Business School. Yeah. Uh, he was, uh, I think, he was head of Lytton Industries for a while, That's and right. uh, mm -hmm. he was a businessman. A friend mm -hmm. of mine was chairman of Manhattan Industries, mm -hmm. which is on the New York Stock Exchange. He's head of the MBA program at Florida Southern University, uh -huh. and he loves it. And right. it so he brings the, the, uh, the uh, proven yeah. uh, executive thought process mm -hmm. to the, the theoretical uh, university And how do you background. like that, if I may ask? Huh? Uh, to the degree you do that with the University of Bridgeport and that, how do you like that, dealing as, oh, uh, I love it. as I, a professor? Uh, oh, I, do, I love it. I went out and did a... Uh, I was a... a, a executive in resident at Washington State University for a week, uh -huh. uh, and I just adored that experience. In fact, my wife and I, we were mm. co, mm. Uh, she's a business person, she yeah. runs a jewelry business, mm. and we were co-executives in residence, uh -huh. and we taught classes for one solid week, uh -huh. we lectured, uh -huh. and we had a marvelous time. Oh, you did, you did enjoy it. Was for a week, you wouldn't want to do it for 16 weeks on a ready basis, well, and that kind of thing. Too, <laughs> business with, too busy with... Uh, I don't know how you can do that, and travel it. six months of the year yeah, on business, right. and try to run... Uh, several companies uh, yeah. and do everything else that has to be done. Yeah, right. You uh, know, uh, priorities then, yeah. It is priorities. Uh -huh. And number one priority is my family. Uh -huh. And that comes first. Mm -hmm. And then comes business. Third mm -hmm. is tennis. Mm -hmm. And fourth is education. Uh -huh. So I have really priori uh, prioritized mm -hmm. my life. And mm -hmm. I, anything outside of that, mm -hmm. it'll take a mammoth endeavor to get me to do it because mm -hmm. Uh, there's only so much time in a day. That's right. There's only so many hours in a day. So many, you know, you got to you got to figure out how best to do it. It's a good thing we've got video technology and so forth. We can capture and maybe reutilize, uh, you know, an image of someone on another basis other than just in real time, which was the case historically and so forth. And your ad has been one of the major, uh, you know, forces of education in our society. Congratulate you on all the activity, really. You know, I mean, well, it's a good story. I appreciate story. that. Yeah, it's an interesting story. Well, I'm starting, I'm writing a book, which I hope uh, will be of interest to people, because I didn't try it. It's not a story of my life or mm -hmm. what I've done. It's really trying to help people to be entrepreneurs. Uh -huh. It's called Entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. How to Succeed by uh, Really Trying. How to Succeed by Really Trying, right? Yeah. It's written by Victor Ky Kyam, right? Right. Well, listen, Victor, it's been, been a pleasure. Thank you very much, Harold. Sorry. My even, pleasure. Now, even in cable television, we run out of time, but it's been your pleasure. And, of course, I have the perception of Victor Kayam, the chief executive officer of Remington Products Incorporated and a, uh, and a uh, source of uh, understanding of the entrepreneurial process in, uh, in real terms. And I congratulate you on all your activity and particularly the example that you're setting for others as you come along. All the best on the book and so forth. And, of course, on all of your activities, you move into this exciting entrepreneurial future that you've had such a hand to help to build. Thank you. Very, uh, thanks for viewing very much. We invite you to sit for this evening. We invite you to tuning in next week. We'll be coming back then, but I'm afraid that's it for this particular segment. We'll see you next week. And once again, Mr. Kayam, Victor, if I may, thank you very much indeed for everything. My pleasure.